All right, Derek. Um, so I wanted to ask you a couple questions about cold calling. Uh, why don't you just do us, our viewers, a little bit of a favor. Give us a little introduction of yourself and a little bit of your background. Okay, real estate for 12 years. I do a lot of cold calling social media, um, specializing in actually cold calls and closing people, and um, I think I'm fairly good at it. And I actually discovered you on YouTube. I saw one of the videos you'd uploaded. Um, it was a video of uh, a pretty tough expired listing that you'd called, a woman uh, who gave you quite a bit of objections, 12 minutes worth, to the point where she hung up on you. You called mm -hmm. her back and were able to set the meeting. Uh, yep. I gotta tell you, I was so emotionally invested in this call that when you actually got that meeting, when she said seven o'clock, I was doing fist pumps in my office watching the video. I was, you know, I was really emotionally invested in that. What was the outcome of that meeting? I listed it. Uh, went, actually, well, I went there, and the reality was she owed too much than what it was worth, which is why she was really fighting me so much on the phone. Right. Um, but her husband was a builder, and he actually had another property that I listed with them. I sold it in four days, and that home was on the market again for about a year with no results. And we put it on and got sold in four days. Your industry is the real estate industry, and you do a lot of calls in there. Where did where did you learn your skill of cold calling? The Mike Ferry organization. Okay, and he's uh, an instructor, and he has an online real estate site. Tra yeah, he's a real estate trainer. He's been doing it for probably 40, 50 years. He's one of the best in the business. Uh, basically, almost all the top guys in the world have trained with this guy. Well, how do you feel about a script for somebody who's starting out? Do you think that's a good way to go? They should write their own. You have, you have to. You can't. You can't figure out. You can't pioneer your own path. You got to see what who people have done it before and follow that. Once you get the framework, you can go off of that. But it takes time. I mean, I've been doing this twelve years. I'm just starting, starting to do it now. You know what I mean? Right, right. And you, and you, how long in, in that twelve years did it take you to really refine that skill to the point where you're at now? Or is it an ongoing process that's kind of always changing? Uh, well, I, I trained with Ferry for five years, and I, I don't train with them anymore. Uh, I know the system, and I pretty much just made it mine and evolved over the last two years. And I started to come up with new ideas. I use social media, but as far as the cold call stuff, um, I just really got told to get lost enough time where I had to ch keep changing until I found something that worked. Okay, I've heard that quite a bit from the people who try it, and, and it kind of creates this overwhelming fear for them of, of keeping making those calls uh, right. when they get these rejections all the time. What would you say to somebody like that who has that fear of picking up the phone and making the calls? I think the longer you stare at the phone, the heavier it becomes, if you understand what I'm saying with that. It just gets harder. If you, you just got to pick it up the call and go. Just pick it up and go. and then Just just go for it. Two feet in the puddle. You know what I mean? I mean, is there, is there any type of mantra or something you do to put yourself in a certain mindset to make those calls? It's funny, I made a video about that because I got so many people from those videos asking me what I do to get warmed up. I dance in my office. I made a, I made a crazy dance video where I just danced to Paula D's music. But lately I've been going to YouTube, typing in motivational speech and just watching like four videos um, saying some affirmations and just going. When you first started making call, uh, cold calls, what were some of your biggest setbacks that you, you, you had? Not knowing what to say. Like being kind of nervous, being scared, not knowing exactly what to say. But I started, I just stick to the scripts and after a while it just kind of flourish on its own, but at first it's just the fear of not knowing what to say, you know what I mean, just kind of, I think that's everyone's, you know, they're, they're not scared of actually doing it, it's just because they don't know what to say that, to keep it going. Do you recommend someone who has a list of leads, and maybe some are warmer than others, to wait until they've called all the other ones and gotten some experience to hit those warmer leads? I mean, that's nice, some people recommend you call your database first, and talk to people that like you, and kind of start knocking that rejection, get warmed up, and then go. A lot of times also, we role play a lot, so I role play twice a day, usually at 7.30 and again at 10.30, and I role play with agents on objection handlers. And they're from all over the country, we do different stuff. And what are those scenarios kind of like? You sit down with another agent, you, and you have them you know, act yeah, as a buyer? We'll, or... we'll play seller and agent, and you'll be on the phone, I'll call you, and we'll say, hey, I'm not selling, I've got my brother, uh, I'm waiting till spring, whatever. There, we'll have maybe 15 objections in each one of those calls. We'll take 15 minutes on each side to do, and you just get the other agent warmed up. And sometimes you hear new lines that you never use before, you know, that's awesome. And so you, you think learning from some of the other agents in, in that respect has really helped your game? Oh, yeah. I mean, luckily those videos that I got a lot of attention from them, and I got a ton of hits on those, and a lot of the agents, the top agents, saw that and asked me to role play, and that's really what made a difference. You get these top guys, they, they tell you small things, and I was already good. I, I mean, I took my own horn, but I was good at it. It just gets you better. Is it safe to say that everyone in your office is, is just as good as you are? No. <laughs> no. What are some of the common mistakes you see some of those other callers make? And they try, to, they try to set people up for the objection, meaning you try to corral the seller into saying something that you have an objection to handle for 
versus just listening, agreeing, and trying to move the conversation forward with the small piece of information they gave you a nanosecond ago. When you're making cold calls and you, you get in some objections, do you have any like go-to lines that you use to reposition yourself? Yeah. And in fact, if you look here, I mean, if we go back here, every day cold call, I put these boards up, and if you open it up, it just scripts. And it's almost like, to me, a security blanket. I don't use them anymore, but I, I, if they're there, I feel comfortable. But if there's some kind of a line that I don't know of, um, I'll refer back to that and go at it. But I try not to be scripted anymore. I try just to go off of, uh, just never make anyone wrong, try to keep the conversation moving forward. And that's what you see in those videos. It's, it's different than the other videos you'll see. I, I, know, I noticed uh, one line in particular that you, you, you use as, a, I would say, is one of your go-to lines. And it's almost like your close line where you ask them, you know, let's set a meeting. What's better, 5 or 6 o'clock? And I actually said that to you on the phone earlier because I, I hear it so much from you. And I actually incorporate it to my own thing. Why yeah. do you think it is that that line works so well? People like options. They don't want a direct thing. So what works for you, 4 or 5 tomorrow? So you're going to give them an option. They have to, and then you can close. And if they say to you, well... I know those work, and I'd go right to the, well, what works better for you, weekdays or weekends? And i make it real general, or weekends. Okay, and if the weekends are Saturdays or Sundays, usually better. And I'm going to keep narrowing it down. The mornings or afternoons work best for you. Great. So I'll pass it on Saturday at noon. If something changes, call me. If not, we'll go. So I'll keep narrowing it down best I can if that four or five doesn't work. When you make your calls, what's the general goal of your call? You're in the real estate industry. Is your main objective just to get a face-to-face -face? Or do you want to impart information to them about what, you, what it is you do? Well, okay, so every morning I come in, I basically write down my goals. I keep them here every morning. The goal is to make so many contacts and to make so many appointments. And then on each appointment, the, the goal is to list a property. You know, at, at a, find a seller who's, you know, find a seller or buyer who's ready to buy something or sell something in the next three days. So I don't want someone who's going to say, I'll see you next year or next summer. Or, like, I'm going to try to close, close, close. And if I can't, I'll move on. And I says. Don't uh, rejection is the biggest part of this. You have to start getting thick skin. So you said earlier about your people feeling rejected. They have to get rejected, man. You have to fail forward. You know, if I do fifty comics a day, I'll be lucky to get one person to say yes. So that you would say that would be about the ratio. It, it's almost fifty to one where you think where you get success to to, to rejection. It didn't used to be that way. It, 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 as you get better, you get better. And I'm just using that number. It's probably, it's a lot less than that, but. If you're starting out, that would be good for someone to try to get. If you can get one appointment a day. One appointment a day out of that many calls. Yeah. Now, uh, are there any times where you have a cold call where you receive an objection that immediately you know this call is not going any further and you allow them to, to place that objection and move on? Sure. And what type of objections are these and how do you identify something like that? Well, there's certain things. You're talking about there's an objection and then there's another thing called a... Um, I'm trying to think of the word for it, uh, a condition. Like, I can't sell because um, the, I was going to sell because I was buying a house and that fell apart, or I was going to move to Los Angeles for a job because I didn't sell this one, that fell apart, the position's been full. That's condition. You, you can't get past it. There's certain things you just can't get past. Or I was going to sell... Uh, but um, we decided to work something out with the bank, and now we have a loan modification. It went through. We can keep the house. So, some of those conditions you just can't get past. Other times, they may sound a condition, but they're really an objection. You have to – only after experience will you know if that's really an objection or a condition. And if you've if identified one of these conditions, what do you do to, to end the call politely and quickly so you can move on to the next to the next prospect? I, I just basically say, well, I appreciate your time. Best of luck. Thanks for your time, and I'll go. Okay. Yep. Um, one of the challenges a lot of cold callers face is when they're doing business to business calling. Um, sure. There, a lot of times, they're met with a secretary who I like to refer to as the gatekeeper sure. before they can reach any type of decision maker to actually um, conversate with. Do you have any advice or ideas for people in those type of cold calling situations on how to um, disarm at the um, the gatekeeper and move forward and get past that to a decision maker? I mean, it's funny you say that because I get all lines of people calling me on these videos from. Bible salesman to a lady selling solar panels. She saw the video. She just liked it. So they're calling and asking some of the questions. And I think you just, sometimes you do stuff like, you know, hey, I'm calling for Brad. Uh, well, I'm the secretary. Can I talk to you? I'm like, oh, this is Derek. I'm just returning this call. Does he know this is a regards to? Oh, you should. You know, you, it's almost like you're BSing your way through it. You tell a little white lie, but you're still getting into heaven at the end of the year. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. I mean, there's sometimes those small things. There's other things, too. Every field is different. You have to take your time and think about it.
Now, I, I noticed you said that where you said, like, in that, in that example, you had a name of a contact. You had Brad. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's say you didn't have the name of that contact. Would a good idea be then to maybe call from a different number as just a, uh, an innocuous call maybe a day or two before you're going to make a call to try and gain that information? Sure. I mean, that, that's something actually a smart thing, especially if you do that. Um, a lot of times you can go on these different sites, and I notice you guys do a lot of social media, so a lot of times you go on these sites like use LinkedIn, and there's, uh, I think there's another one, the big one, that you can type in whatever someone's position is at the company, and it basically gives you the names. So you'll know what the name is if you can figure that out. But if you can't figure that out, yeah, I'd say who runs the PR department from a different line and, and try to run that way. Right. So you're saying use maybe use a little bit of social engineering is what we'd call that to kind of do some research on the company ahead of time through tools like LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, even Google doing searches on the company. You might be able to find who the representatives are that you'd like to speak with. Exactly. I think that's a great tip for some of the, the viewers and they're going to be readers of this article. Some of the more common objections that I hear, uh, I want to go through them. And if you have you know ideas or tips on how to disarm these, Sure. Go, ahead, go ahead and fire them back at me. One of the most common objections I hear is, I don't have time for this call, or I'm really busy right now. So we have that in our, our business, too. And I'd say something he's like, you know, I don't have time to take this call. And I'd say something like, let me ask you, is $20,000 of the equity worth 10 minutes of your time? Right? So it's a direct benefit. If you, in that situation, you have to take them down right there. That, that's a, that's a, if you don't say something witty there, that's it. You know what I mean? So for me, like a house, I'd say, well, let me ask you, is 20 minutes of your time worth $30,000 of your equity? Oh well, yeah, yeah. Let's get together at five or six, whatever's better for you, right? right. So if, if there's something that you can have a direct benefit that's high risk, then you've got at that point you have to use it. Another one of the uh, objections I hear a lot is in the industry of business to business calling. You hear, you know, we can't really afford this right now. Well, I do hear that. Obviously, they, that's why they go for sale by owner. I'd say something like, you know, well, let me ask you: if you did have money, would you see a benefit in what I'm doing? Well, of course. Great. So if I can put the same net in your pocket that you could on your own, but do all the work for you, would that be interesting to you? Yes. Right. See, so if, if you're selling your product or a service and the company needs it, but they don't, they say they don't want to pay for it. Well, if I could do all this for free, would you hire me? Of course I would. Let's get together and see what the actual costs are, whatever that is. You know what I mean? Right. So you say sometimes in, in that objective, you might move on to you know the idea of showing the value where it it really has no cost to you in the end or. Um, showing the, the value of a, of a demo or a free trial. The next one is, uh, I'm not interested. Just yeah. not interested in, in what, you're, what you're talking about. So I get that, that makes sense to me. If you were interested, can you see the value? Right, so um, what I just did there, was, you, you might have not noticed, I took your objection, I agreed to it, and then I shelved it, right? So I understand, it makes sense to me. If you were interested, would you see the value? And who, well, of course, right. So let's talk about the value, and let's try to get off not interested. I'm going to try to take them away from that and bring them back to on track. And I, and I may not even do that. Some people say to me all the time, people always kind of ask me about objection handling. I say, usually you just try to shelve it and leave it alone unless they keep saying it to you. Like someone says, I'm not selling to the spring. No, I get that. And when you do sell, whether it's now the spring, where are you moving to? So I'm just going to sh agree, hear it, uh, let them know I've heard it, repeat it back, then move forward. Most objections aren't really what you think they are. They're not stop the call. It's just they're just staying a, something like, I'm not sure if I like you. Um, the objection is I've already used your, a service like yours before. Kind of like when I call and they already listed with the Keller Williams agent. They're like, oh, well, we already listed with your company. And they automatically assume you're the same. You know, it's, it's, so, you, so basically what I say is, you know, I get that. I, it, it makes sense to me. At the end of the day, you guys want to get this home sold, right? Yes. Well, let's talk about that. And I just try to keep them off that. If, if you said a service, like I've used a service like this before, oh, really? What was that? And I'll ask them about their experience. And, and how was that? Well, we didn't like it. What didn't you like about it? I didn't like that it did X, X Y, and Z. Okay, so if we could have something that does X, doesn't do X, Y, and Z, but gets the job done, would you be interested? Yeah, that's why we need to get together today at 5 or tomorrow at 6. You know, one of the lines that I've seen you use, and, I, and I'm a big fan of this line, um, is that if you're under the assumption that the last guy couldn't get it done, does that mean that you think it can't be done? And I, I've seen you arm, I disarm the similar objection using that line, and I think that's a line that the people can really benefit from. Well, not only that, but it also what line plays into that is I have people say to me before, like if I'll call, I'm not South Shore of Boston, if I call into Boston, it's a different sort of area, it's an hour away from me, but they'll say stuff like, well, how many million dollar homes have you sold? And I'm like, well, how many million dollar homes did your last agent sell? Well, he sold 30. Did he sell yours? No. Well, then who cares how many he sold? I mean, the idea is you want to get your home sold, right? Exactly. Let's talk about how we can do that differently. You know what I mean? You just try to get them off that. So same situation. Okay. 
the next objection commonly is, and it's kind of similar to some, to some we've talked about before. I'm not, in, I'm not looking to, to, to relist my home or I'm not looking for your service right now. No, I, I get that. I understand it. And that makes sense to me. Let me ask you, when you were looking for the service, what kind of service were you looking for? I, I'm just going to play with the words there. You know what I mean? Right. So in, in a nanosecond, I'm going to take what you just said. I'm going to let you know I, I understand what you said, and I'm going to feed it back to you in a different route. You know, when you, when you were selling, what were you looking for? Well, we were going to go to Florida. Oh, okay, so what's down there? And I'm going to ask about their motivation. And then I'm going to go back to pushing them forward to get to the point with me. Other, so I'll say something like I had a guy the other day say, I'm going to get to Florida. What's out there? Well, I play golf. And I'd say something funny like, oh, and uh, humor is a big part of this. So do you, do you have a PGA card yet? <laughs> no. Right? You laugh a little bit. I said, so is only stopping you from getting a PGA card to sale of this house? Well, yeah. Let's get together and talk about that. Because if that's possible, can you still get that in for golf, golf season? Yeah. So you, th you think a, a great way to disarm some of the objections is, is with humor? Oh, I, I always use a lot of humor. You probably heard some of that in some of those calls. I like to make people laugh. When I call for sale by owners, I got a line from a buddy of mine. And, uh, you know, people, sale by owners don't want to talk to realtors. They're like, we're selling on our own. That's it. And I'll say something like, geez, let me ask you, why didn't you use a realtor? Is, is it because you hate us? And, and they'll say no, but listen to what they do afterwards. They'll say no, we, we like realtors. They'll start qualifying themselves to me. You see, it's, it's the craziest thing. Or I'll say, what do you think the disadvantage of using a realtor is in this market? Well, I don't think there's one. I mean, you guys do A, B, and C. Now they're qualifying on why we should work together. What you try to do in that case is, is try to show them then, what if I could net you the same amount that you would make selling it by owner, selling it you know, through us? And do all the work. Right, and do all the well, work. We use it. Right, let's get together and I'll show you that plan. Okay. And this, this last objection that I want to talk about, or maybe not the last one, but the, the most, one of the most common ones that I get that I think people mistake sometimes as success on a cold call is, you know, can you send me some information? You know, why don't you just, why don't you send me an email and send me some information? And a lot of times I think that people mistake this for success as, okay, they're interested in my product, they want me to send me information. When I see it as an objection, they're just trying to get you off the phone. Off the phone. They're not going to look at that. You know, there's no way. They tell me that all the time. Hey, send me something in the mail. I'm like, okay, what do you want me to send you? And you put it on them. Oh, I don't know. Well, what do you send? I don't know either. I mean, basically, I sell houses. Let's do this. Instead of me sending something in the mail, let me come down and talk to you for five minutes. I mean, it's really about relationships. Let me take a look at the home, and I always sell them a couple benefits. Let me see if I have a buyer for it. If I do, I can get you guys down to Florida. You can join the golf thing. If not, maybe I can spot some reasons why I think the home didn't sell, and I can show you how to get it sold. So whether you want to sell now or in spring, you'll have a plan B. Fair enough? Boom. Most people just, you know, they, they tend to, okay, I'll send you some information, and, and then they send it, and then they try to make follow-up calls, but now they, they have your number in their database, they don't want you calling. What's the most unusual or unexpected ob objection that you've ever gotten? Uh, one time I had a guy say that the reason his home didn't sell was because he has UFOs landing in his yard, and he had crop circles, right? So I told you I do a lot of humor. Yeah. I said to him, I said, I said, let me ask you. Would you rather sell this home and get down to Florida, or would you rather stay at this house and deal with the pro the anal probing all year? <laughs> right? And he just laughed. He just laughed about it. And he said, no. I mean, he's like, and he wasn't even serious. He was just saying it safe to get me off the phone. Yeah. But once, once he felt that I was part of his tribe, meaning I was funny and he liked it, right. he, opened, he opened up a bit more and I got into the property. It, well, I tell you, it happens all the time. You have to, when you talk to these people, is like tonality is a big part of it. Now, me and you were talking here. It's a little fast. We're going to try to make sure we get everything into it and an idea. But when I'm on the phone, I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to mirror and match people. I'm going to have the same tonality they do. And when I talk to them, number one, I'm not going to make them look stu feel stupid at all. But I'm going to try to make them feel like I understand what they're saying. I, I'd be, like, genuine with them. And, and I, I, I generally am. I mean, I'm not there just to make a quick buck. I, want to, I don't want to hear everyone's story, but I, I want to find out if I can help this person. There's something I can do so I come from a place of integrity, you know. And it, it just people feel that through the phone. But if you're on the phone – just trying to pound through it, they can smell your commission breath, if that makes sense. I yeah. see, I've seen videos of other people on, on YouTube making cold calls, and I've seen them make hundreds of calls in a row just in a, in a monotone, robotic voice, and they're not getting anywhere with anyone. And no. people just have a natural aversion to that kind of thing. Yeah, so you think and, and, and people call me. Like, I'll talk to people who are like, like I call early. I call 8 o'clock in the morning. People in the morning aren't the happiest people. And I've had guys say the F-bomb at me, and, and, and so once they break that sort of uh, line of communication when they start saying those kind of words, I give it right back to them, 
And same thing, they think I'm part of their tribe. Like that's how they used to talk to people and get talked to. And that's just what it is. So you think it's a, it's a, a good strategy and a good idea to, to generally match and mirror the tone of the, the person you're speaking with? Yeah, and see, me and you were doing this a lot. About, if you saw the video, you're doing this, and I'm doing a lot of this. You're naturally doing a lot of this because you see me doing this hand movement. Right. I'm doing it because I see you. We're mirror and matching each other. I'm also talking. Italian, so I have a little bit of that going on, yeah. too. All right. <laughs> I'm Polish, but I'm just mirror and matching you, man. Um, now, I'm sure you've been on the receiving end of cold calls from time to time. Sure. Um, how do you handle someone when they when they cold call you? I love it. I give them objections. I love to hear everything I have to say because I always think maybe I can hear something I have. Like I'll say, oh, I need to ask my wife or, you know, I'm already using a system like that. Or maybe in six months can they call me back? And I just want to hear what they say. And I had one guy on the phone keep me on the phone for like 18 minutes the other day. And I was like, man, you know, you're good. And he goes, he said the same thing you said. You know, I know who you are. I watched your videos. I'm like, really? <laughs> I was like, I'm impressed. Not that he used my skills, but he just kept me on the phone, and I'll never hang up on him. I just want to hear if I can get them to hang up. Now, do, when you were on the call with the, some of these cold calls that call you, do you hear anything that's kind of like a pet peeve where it kind of makes you shudder a little bit, like, oh, I can't believe he said that? Yeah, I can totally tell when they script it, when they're reading off a script, I can hear it. Because I know this, in some of your calls, you're using uh, a programming software called Mojo to make your calls. Is that right? Yep. What are some of the advantages you have of this, and who would you recommend it to? Well, you know, it's funny. Anyone who's making calls can use it because it's not just about real estate. It's, about, it's a triple dialer, and what you do is you load in numbers uh, from any source, and you can run in a CSV file, and you can have all the numbers in Excel, spreadsheet, anything. You can dump them in there, and it just calls, and it's wicked cool because if it's loaded the correct way, if you have the parameter set up, which Mojo helps you set up the stuff, when you call, all the information comes up, like who you're calling, what the position is, what the phone number you're calling is, and you can ideally take notes so when you call back again, those notes pop up as you make that call again, which is really cool. How do you feel about leaving voicemails for... for I don't leave them. Don't leave them. Just move on. I call, yeah, I just call them back. The Mojo system allows you to put whatever number you want to show up on call ID there. So if I'm calling, I can make their cell phone show up on their own call ID if I want to, which is pretty cool. So... That's another a huge advantage, I would think, of the software is that it allows you to display any number that you'd like on their caller ID. Yeah, exactly. So they don't, So if you want to call one day with X and then call next day with Y, call next day with Z, and they're going to get a different guy each time. That's, that's actually a, a, a great advantage to that. I use multiple lines to do the same similar effect, but I, I imagine a software would, would help a lot of people who want to achieve this idea where they, maybe they're going to do some mining for information in the first couple calls and then go ahead and make their cold call. Uh, yeah. sales call. And you think that even a beginning level cold caller could utilize something like this? A uh, triple dialer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you, like, so uh, uh, normally if I do 50 contacts a day, if I'm using two phones and I'm going back and forth, like, I have two phones here. Right. If, I, if I'm doing back and forth down and make 50 contacts, it takes me about five and a half hours, which is a big part of my day. If I use Mojo, I'm done in three, which is two and a half hours of more time to do whatever else I want to do. Just direct benefit time saves. It, it just it just bangs it right out. It's, it's a great thing. Is there anything that you can think of that we haven't spoke about that you think is a, is a great asset to yourself and your toolbox when making calls that you think other people should know about? Well, I, I think, number one, you have to get motivated in the morning. Um, I, I, so a part of it is, I'll, I'll take this down and show you guys. So I coach with Mike Ferry. I also coach with Tony Robbins. You guys are familiar with Tony Robbins? Obviously, Anthony yes, Robbins? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I coach with both those guys in the past. One of the things they gave me, and I'll show you here, something I do every morning, and if you can see this picture here, it's a stick figure. And you'll see all these small little points above his eyebrows, cheekbones, nose, uh, clavicle hair, belly button, armpits. These are all pressure points. And part of, one of the part of things I do when I say affirmations, and Tony developed this, was you touch, those, you touch those points when you say affirmations. But before you say affirmations, you get in the zone. Like if I'm going to call and I want to be motivated, I'm going to think about what my goals are. If my goal is to get 50 calls, I'll say something like, I do this every morning, so you guys can hear it. I am prospecting with high skills empathy to really touch and motivate someone to work with me. So I'll think about being on a call, how it feels. I'll think of the person smiling, me smiling, answering questions, being witty, having fun. Once I'm in that zone, I'll start saying the affirmations. And I kind of, after I do all those affirmations, I kind of get that idea like I feel good. And you have to feel good to make these calls because they're not easy. There's a reason why I know not a lot of people want to do it. It's hard, man. It's not It's not for the weak of heart, the, the thin skin. But if you can get it and get good, you can make a lot of money. It really does take a lot to get past 
and get going. Once you once you get yourself going, you get yourself in the mood uh, to make the cold calls and you get yourself right. Uh, what do you do to stay in that mode? You have to make sure you, you do your calls first thing in the morning. You have to be on in the morning because that's when you have your most energy, right? After two o'clock, you're thunderstruck. You're like, oh god. And sometimes I have to make later calls, so I, I have one of these. Which you show me drinking now. This is sort of the the rock star drink. Right, right, right. I'm doing another round of calls in about 15 minutes. Uh, but basically, what I do is um, in the morning, I just do these affirmations. I try to always listen to something funny in the background. So I, I there's a guy named Greg Giraldo that I really think is a great comedian. Yeah, I'm familiar with him. Shame. Yeah, and, and he always passed away. He's got some great material. So a lot of his stuff playing in the background. Uh, when a call comes on, I'll stop it. But uh, I, I like to laugh a lot. And if I sing that funny mode, it keeps me going. Sometimes music does it too. Like music really touches my soul. It's one of those things that I, I don't think I can live without. So um, I listen to a lot of music sometimes. And I, it, it varies. Some days I feel like I'm, I want a country. Other days it's rock. Some days it's rap. It's whatever I want. And I just have that going in the background to keep me motivated. And I've seen the response to your videos. It's overwhelmingly positive, And it makes people feel that... I can do this too if I have the tool sets and I do the training and do the research. And you're giving that ability to some of these people that have those overwhelming fears of making the cold calls. They're seeing how much rejection you're getting in these cold calls and overcoming each one of these objections to the right. point where you actually close the deal after 12 minutes of being told no. That, is that, oh. that brings this to these people. They said, okay, I guess this is possible. Maybe I'm supposed to be told no over and over and over again. You don't know how many people have called me from Canada to Australia and I've seen the video and said, dude, I didn't know it could be done that way. Like, thank you for posting these. Like, it just shows me that there is another way. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, I, I, unless there's any other points that you want to make, um, I think that I, I've covered just about all the questions I had written in my interview. Going back to what you asked me a minute ago, what are some of the big tips? Number one is, like you said, get motivated in the morning so you get pumped. Get on the phone. Don't think about it. Just pick it up and start dialing. I mean, obviously have your script that you need to have. Don't just try to wing it. Have something written out. I'm going to have an amount of questions I want to ask. Whenever you ask a question, listen for the response, repeat it back to them, affirm that, and then move on. So, uh, would you like to sell your house? No. No? Okay. If you did sell it, where would you go next? Portland. Portland. What takes you down that way? That sounds exciting. I'm going to get a job interview. A job. Awesome. You know, and if you just keep moving on, so you, you I, I, I listen to your question, I repeated it back to you, so you know I heard you, then I've affirmed it, said that makes sense to me, then I move on to my next question or my next close. So if you just do that, that's going to be super nuts and better than anybody. And call in the morning, that's when you are up. That's when people are up doing business. In response to that call in the morning thing, I've actually heard um, quite a few people that would say, uh, for business to business calls, one of the best times to call is... You know, that between 4.30 to 5.30, when you might get the receptionist heading out of the office. And the person who answers the phone when the receptionist is out of the office at 5 is generally the owner, if he's still there. If you really put your heart and soul into this, you're going to call on the morning and the afternoon. You're going to try both all, Oh, you're going to be calling all day long. Right. Right. Yeah, you got, you got to pick times. You know what I mean? So when I first used to door knock, I, when I, after, after three weeks of not getting anyone home, I said, oh, Jesus, I've got to wait till after 6 when people, most people are home. Or weekends. All right, Derek. Uh, I'll let you make your calls. Um, if you have any questions for me or anything else you wanted to add, uh, I guess now would be the time to do that. Otherwise, I'll let you go. Anybody know anybody looking to buy or sell real estate in Massachusetts, give me a call, 508-326-5320. I don't have a business yet, but I'm working hard to earn it. All right, guys. Everyone, I want you to know that Derek uh, is a rock star of what he does, and you should be paying very close attention to the, the skills and tips that he's given you. Um, it's going to really help you in your own business and cold calling. Derek, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, it was very nice talking to you. You too, bud. Have a good one.